We're here at our fifth value of this little series. We've looked at biblical truth. Um, we've looked at focused outreach, biblical truth, and Christ-centered worship and intentional care. And today, uh, we're looking at transformed lives. If you have your Bible, look with me to Colossians chapter number three. Colossians chapter number three. Uh, we're looking at a very powerful passage. I'm going to make a pretty strong statement here. Uh, if we were to take out verses 12 to 17 uh, out of this Colossians study, and we were to do away with the rest of the Bible and only had these few verses uh, encapsulated in these, you would discover that everything that Jesus ever taught about and preached about uh, are wrapped up. We'd have enough wrapped up in these few verses. In the previous verses, especially around verse number eight, Paul is saying, I want you to put off the old man. And he gives us a long list of liabilities to the Christian life that we are to take off and to cast aside. In these uh, few verses that we're gonna look at very hurriedly this morning, uh, Paul is telling us, here are the things that you are to put on. Here are the things that you are to clothe yourself with. Uh, if I could name the message this morning, I would entitle it very simply, Conversion Clothing. Conversion Clothing. Uh, this is what we are to clothe ourselves with. Uh, if you and I were to meet in the hallway in the next few minutes and I were to say to you, how you doing? And you say, well, I'm surviving. Oh, I, I've got news for you. God wants you to do a whole lot more than just survive. He wants you to thrive. He, he doesn't want you just to slide in under the gates of heaven. And when you get there, St. Peter says, well, uh, I see that you made it. And you were able to say, well, by the skin of my teeth, I just barely made it in. That, that's not what God intends for us. Not only do we see here the clothing of conversion, it's really a great recipe for a victorious Christian life. So we're going to pick it up now and I want you to see the very first aspect of it. Notice if you will the identification in Christ that we have. Verse number 12. You ready? Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, and long-suffering. Now, one of the issues that we're facing in modern Christianity today in the evangelical church is we don't know who we are. We have lost our identity. Uh, we've never discovered who we are in Christ, and we don't know who Christ is uh, in us. That's why we get every day, we get beat up, we get maligned, uh, we get attacked by the enemy and we come home licking our wounds every day of our life, just barely getting by while the devil is having a field day with us. It's all revolving around the fact that we don't know who we are in the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul sets out in verse number 12 to remind us who we are. Now notice this word that he's using in here. He says, you are, by the way, he is speaking to the church. He is speaking to those that are saved. He's speaking to those of us that have been transformed by the power of God. He says, first of all, you are the elect. You are the chosen of God. Now, when I was a kid uh, growing up over in the mountains of North Carolina, uh, we didn't have a whole lot of activity around where I lived. Uh, very remote, a uh, mountainous area, 10 miles really from town. And uh, it, it, we had really no social life out there except uh, just a few people around us. And, and, and I had uh, really uh, no sports background at all. And my mom and dad uprooted us and moved us to uh, Marietta, South Carolina, which is about 30 minutes down the mountain. And I got down there and I discovered a whole new world. Uh, that sports was really the number one thing going on with kids. Well, I found myself way behind the learning curve. 
uh, and, and that caused me not to get chosen when there was time to choose up sides as to who's going to play on a particular team. And so I sat on the bench a lot during those early years. Uh, I, I wasn't chosen very much uh, to play in those early years. I, personally, I used it as an impetus to really excel. And, and, and yet in those early years, uh, I, I, I really had a problem because it created in me uh, really a kind of a complex. Uh, I, I struggled with that. I, I, I thought maybe I was just inferior because I, I didn't have all of these skills. That he, can you imagine what it was like, though, the day that somebody opened up the Word of God and showed me that I was chosen by God? I, I was the elect of God. That, that made a huge difference in my heart and in my mind. Now, I'll, I'll be very quick to tell you, I really don't understand the, the doctrine of grace, or excuse me, the doctrine of election fully. I, I've yet to meet the person who understands the doctrine of election fully. I, I, I've kind of resolved it in my mind that when I get to heaven outside the gate, it's, it's going to be whosoever will may come. And I get in on the other side of the gate, it's chosen before the foundation of the world. I, I'm all right with that. So I don't understand all uh, fully uh, about it. I do know this. I've been chosen. And I am a recipient of the grace of God. If you study Deuteronomy, you discover that, that, that God chose the nation of Israel, not on the basis of the fact that maybe Israel was intellectually superior or because they had military prowess. He didn't choose them because of any personal attributes that they had that others did not have. If you study Deuteronomy, you'll discover that he chose the nation of Israel on the basis of his Love, and, and so when I get to thinking about God choosing me, it wasn't because of any special ability or special looks or special talents. He chose me on the basis, the same as he did Israel, on the basis of his love for me. So, so I am uh, elect. So when you get down on yourself, you're having a little bit of a pity party and maybe you feel like that you're insignificant in some fashion or another. Uh, if you've been saved by the grace of God, all you have to think is that God chose me. That'll change your whole day. Now, now notice what he says in this next little phrase. Holy. Holy. You're the elect, but you are also holy. Now, don't go to work tomorrow. And your boss comes in and says, how you doing today? Don't look back at him and say, I'm holy. <laughs> You'll think you're a sandwich short of a picnic. I promise you, it, you, you don't want to do that. The world already has the idea that we're a bunch of goody two shoes, you know, and that we walk around with a halo around our head. The word holy here really is the word hagios. It means that you are unique and you've been Special, You have been set aside and set, aside, set apart for a unique purpose. So you are holy. Notice the next little word. It's the word beloved. I like that word. I, I don't know about you, but I, I like the word beloved. You are elect, you are holy, and you are beloved. We Weymouth says this about that word. He says it means you're greatly and most profoundly loved. You, you, you need to grab this. God loves you with an agape love. God loves you with an unconditional love. No matter the times that you blow it, no matter the times that you have failed, no matter the times that maybe uh, you have had uh, some kind of uh, overwhelming malady that hits your life, God still loves you. Now, I've made a lot of horrible mistakes in this life. I've committed some horrible sins in this life. 
But, but the fact of the matter is my behavior does not alter the fact that God loves me. Now what happens is it begins to evoke his discipline on me because he does love me and who he does love, he disciplines and chase. So when I blow it, when I make a mistake, when I commit some horrible sin, it never alters the fact that God unconditionally loves me. I love what Romans 8 says that nothing in life or in death shall ever separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Nothing. Now, let me ask you something. You got up real early this morning. You got dressed and uh, you just kind of ho-hum came into the church today. And we've sung some pretty good songs. Do you feel better already? I mean, just think with me for a minute. Think with me for a minute. You just found out God chose me. You just found out that you are uniquely set apart for God to use you. And, and you just found out that no matter how much I mess up, it's not going to alter the fact that God loves me. You ought to feel better. You ought to feel better. Now, there's another aspect of the transformed life. And number two, it's the manifestation of our life in Christ. The manifestation of our life in Christ. Now, what does the word manifestation mean? It means to reveal. It means to display. It means to show forth something that is observable. Now, what Paul then does is that he proceeds now to give us eight essentials that we are to clothe ourselves with that indicate that our life has been changed, that our life has been transformed, that we've been made anew. Notice the two little words that he puts in there in, in verse 12. He says, put on, put on. It's a verb. It's an action word. Now, I know a little bit of Greek and I know a little bit of Hebrew. The Greeks run the restaurant and the Hebrews run the tailor shop. I know a little bit about it. But this is in the aorist imperative tense. Now, that may not mean a whole lot to anybody, but let, let me just tell you what it is. It is, first of all, a command. It's not optional for us. If we're going to show forth the transformed life, we have to obey this command. We've got to put it on. Also, it's a once and for all act. You, you don't put these essentials on and take them off and put them on and take them off and put them on and take them off. Paul says this is once and for all. It is a permanent act uh, on our part. Now notice he goes on. He starts out with the very first one. He says, bowels of mercies. You ought to write somewhere down there in the margin of your Bible, the word compassion, tenderhearted, pity and mercy. It's really the capacity to be moved to the needs of others. Let me say that again. I think it's worthy of repeating. The capacity to be moved to the needs of others. Do you remember when Jesus looked out over the multitudes and the Bible says that he saw them as a sheep that uh, did not have a shepherd. And the Bible says that he was moved with compassion toward them. He was affected by the things that affected them, the sick, the hurting. He identified with those needs. And so Paul is coming along and he says, I want you to put that on. I, I want you to wear that, this clothing of compassion. I, I probably reveal too much and I'm too, much, too transparent oftentimes in sermons. But I am going to confess to you, I haven't arrived here yet. Now, I'm a lot better than I used to be. Okay? I'm a lot better than I But I still got a ways to go. I, I still haven't arrived in this area of compassion. I need to grow some in this area. Kathy and I are so very different, especially... Uh, in the early years of our marriage. I, I'll give you an example. I, I, I don't like running over animals. I, I just, oh, 
I, when, when, when one kind of darts out in front of me, I, I just cringe and I don't like it. In the early years of our marriage, y'all, y'all ever run over a squirrel? You ever look in your rear view mirror and the tail is going like this right here? You know? In my early years, what I, want, I look at Kathy and I say, you know what, I, I really ought to stop and, and, and back over it again and put it out of its misery. <laughs> now you animal rights people, please don't write me any letters. I get enough of them already. And, and Kathy's just appalled at that kind of a statement. She said, what, 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 what would you do that to me? <laughs> well, there've been days, but anyway. Um, <laughs> Please don't say anything to her in the hall when you see her in a few minutes. But, 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 you know, I just, alcoholism robbed me of my adolescence. And, and, and so I really had to struggle for a number of years when I would come across a drunk. My first thoughts were, well, you idiot. It's your fault. If you just stayed away from the sauce, you wouldn't be like you are right now. Just, you know, I'm not going to help you. It's your fault. You made the mess. You get out of it. Or, or, or is that the way Jesus would have responded? I kind of doubt it. I, I look at John 8. John 8 is one of my favorite of all scriptures. A matter of fact, I use it a lot in revivals about the woman that was caught in adultery. You remember the story? The, the, these Pharisees caught her and, and, and brought her into the presence of Jesus. And what did Jesus do? Did he, did he lamb blast her and condemn her? Absolutely not. Matter of fact, he dealt more severely with the attitudes of those that caught her than they did her. So where are your accusers? Well, there's none here, Lord. Well, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. But, but we, we have a ways to go. I, I just pray that when we see those that are suffering, those that are hurting, that we would be moved with what moves the heart of God and have compassion. Now notice the next word that he uses is the word kindness. Kindness. It means a sweetness of disposition. It, it, is, it is the idea here of a wine that has lost its harshness. Wine that has lost its tartness. Wine that has become mellow. That, that's the idea behind this word Kindness. Notice the next, it goes right together with the next word in humility. Now in Paul's day, pride and arrogance were great attributes that a person was to have in their life. I I mean, it was good for you to be proud. It was good for you to be arrogant. But Jesus comes along and he changes the whole definition of all of that. And and Paul says that we are to be humble. In, in, In Philippians 2, he taught us something. He taught us that count others better than yourself. And you say, well, I would, but they're not. But we ought not to think more highly of ourselves than we ought. Y'all must understand, we are never, ever, we're, we're never going to display this characteristic of the transformed life of humility and kindness until we get to be just like John the baptizer. When we come to the place that we say, he must increase and I must decrease. I went home one Sunday at Sunday lunch, had a big old spread at the house, got got my fill, leaned back in my chair, thinking good about the day, Sunday afternoon, thinking good about what happened. I look over at Kathy, honey, uh, not many great preachers left, are there? She says, yeah, and there's one less than you think. Mm -hmm. Humble yourself or your wife will. Notice the next one is the word meekness or gentleness, if you will. It it, it means to get angry at the right time over the right issue at the right person. I I, I can't help but think about Jesus. 
Uh, you, you remember when he went in and turned over the tables of the money changers? You, you ever thought about how that he approached that scenario? Do you, do you think that he may have pulled the, the money changers together and, and sat down on a stool with them and he said, hey guys, uh, I, I'm glad you came to sit. I, I just got something on my heart I want to talk to you about. And you, you know, this money changing business uh, here in the temple, uh, I don't mean to be offensive to you, uh, but uh, I was just wondering maybe possibly if you could consider having it on another day or, or possibly uh, changing the venue all together. Do you think that that's the way Jesus approached it? No. The Bible says he got him a whip. He went into that temple, turned over the tables, let the pigeons free, and he whipped them all of the way out of the temple and said, you've taken my father's house. You've offended my father and you've made the place of worship a den of thieves. Hmm. Angry at the right issue, at the right time with the right people. Uh, that, that's the terminology that is here. That's the word gentleness. May, may I ask you a question? Is, is that a mark in your life? Hey, let, let, let me narrow it on down just a little bit further. What about in your home? Is that a mark with your wife? Are you gentle with her? Is, is that a mark with your husband? Now the next word is long suffering. It means the spirit which waits. <laughs> I guess this, it would be synonymous with the word patience. It's all I'm going to say about that. I'm going to skip over it and we're going to go to the next word. No, no, no. <laughs> the, the Amplified Bible says this. That which is tireless and long-suffering and has the power to endure whatever comes with good temper. Patience. Long suffering. Now, notice verse 13. Forbearing one another. That, that means held back or hold back or hold up for a moment. It, it, it's the attitude that learns to shut up until all of the facts are in. And then even when all of the facts get in, it may be better if you were to keep your mouth shut and not say anything even then. You, you hold back. You hold up. In other words, listen to this. It's learning to put up with a whole lot of the dumb things that your husband does. It's learning to put up with a whole lot of the dumb things your kids do. It's learning to put up with a whole lot of the dumb things your parents do. So, so you, you hold up, you hold back before you get real critical toward them. Okay, num number seven is forgiving each other. Oh my. Um, I don't know what it is about mountain people. Uh, I are one. Uh, but, but we have difficulty in this area, forgiving somebody. We, we, we have somebody that, let me just ask you, do, you, do you have anybody that's ever lied about you? You ever had anybody cheat you? You ever had anybody talk behind your back? You ever had anybody do you wrong? And, and have you had trouble, maybe uh, in the process of that, have you had trouble forgiving that person? Or, or letting that go? And you get so mad when they do, and your attitude immediately comes to the forefront. I'm going to tell you, you may have done this to me, but buddy, you just wait. The day's coming. I will get back with you. But what does the word say? The, the word says, hmm. Revenge is mine, saith the Lord. Now, why does he say that? Because he knows that if we begin to enact revenge against those that have done us wrong, that have uh, talked bad about us, that have lied about us, that have cheated us, that we're going to blow it. We're not going to do it correctly. And God says, let me do it because I'll do it much more thoroughly and much more effective than you ever will. So... Leave it to him, he says. Now, the key to forgiveness is found also in verse 13. I hope you'll look there with me. Uh, he says, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. 
When I was about, I think I said 33 at eight o'clock. Let me correct it. When I was about 35, 36 years old, uh, I went in to the prayer room, uh, 24 hour prayer room we had underneath the Sossaman Chapel accessible. I, it was a, a middle of a, a Saturday afternoon, if I remember right. And I just stretched out over the carpet and buried my face in that carpet. And I let go of a lot of bitterness and I let go of a lot of uh, harboring resentment in my heart. And, and, and it was a powerful day when I realized for the first time, I don't have any right whatsoever to hold anything against anybody else because of what Christ has forgiven me of. When I real, listen to this, when I realized that the superior was able to forgive the inferior, then I had no right as an inferior holding something against another inferior. God set me free. And I've never been the same since. Now here's a statement that some of you may have a little bit of difficulty with. Um, the minute that I withhold forgiveness, the very minute that I harbor bitterness in my heart, in my life, is the very minute that I have elevated myself above God. I dare say that there are many that are in this room that God's doing a work in you even now that before the day is over, you're going to have to go to somebody that you have harbored resentment and forget, unforgiveness toward and bitterness toward, and you're going to need to make it right. Why? Because of everything Jesus has forgiven you of. All right. Number eight is uh, found in verse 14. And above all these things, Put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. Above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfectness. Here's what I discovered in preparation of this sermon. You ready? This, this came alive to me while I was getting ready for you. I went back and I looked at all those first seven that we just looked at, all those words that we just looked at. Shake your head like that. I, I know what you're talking about, okay? I realized I can't do any of that. I can't be patient. I can't be forgiving. I can't be gentle. I can't be humble. Unless I have the thing that holds all of it together. And that's love. It makes it possible for us. When we have love. All right, number three. It, it's what I call the demonstration. Uh, I don't have time to finish this sermon, but I, I, I've got to do a couple of things. Look at verse 15. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts to the which also you are called in one body and be ye thankful. The peace of God, let the peace of God, the word rule here, Write this down somewhere where you'll never forget it. The word rule here means umpire. Let the peace of God umpire your heart. Let the peace of God referee your heart. Boy, that came so real to me this weekend. I can't, I can't hardly wait to tell you. Uh, does anybody in the room know that I love to play golf? I, I do. I, I love to play golf. I haven't played in two or three weeks, but I, I love to play golf. Yesterday was a beautiful day. A couple of men in church asked me in the middle of the week, Pastor, can you play golf with us on Saturday morning? My response was, I, I'd love to if I can get my sermon finished. And, and I think I'll be all right. Now, this is like Wednesday. Friday morning, I didn't have a clue. So they said, you coming tomorrow? You coming tomorrow? You coming tomorrow? I said, I'm going to do my best. I'll let you know later on in the afternoon. Afternoon came. You coming tomorrow? You coming tomorrow? You coming tomorrow? Now I've got this war going on, okay? I've got a war going on. I love to play golf. I want to go play golf. But I also know 
that eight o'clock Sunday morning's coming and I have to have a word from God. Amen. And at that time, I didn't have a word from God. So I sent him, sent him a note back later on and I said, listen, guys, listen to the statement, listen to the statement. I don't have peace. I don't have peace. The peace of God. I had, I, had to, I had to ask, the peace of God. And when I, when I made the determination later on that night, I, I, still, didn't, I still didn't say no. I still want to go. My, my wife will tell you, I struggled with this all day Friday, all day. And even in, I stayed up until midnight, all day Friday, till midnight, Friday night, trying to get that sermon ready so that I could go play golf. But I didn't have peace. So he said, let the peace of God umpire. And when I, you know what I, when I finally said, I can't go play golf because I don't have a word from God for Sunday morning, all of a sudden the peace of God overwhelmed me and I couldn't get it down fast enough. Amen. Kathy and I, we'll get in a rift. Now I know that that surprises some of you. And, and, and we'll just get in, and I don't mean to knock down, I don't mean to be ugly. I, I'm, I'm just saying that there, there'll be some times that we, we'll have a decision to make and I want to go in one direction, she wants to go in another. Just normal marriage stuff. And, and, and so we evoke the peace of God. We call on the peace of God to come and umpire. And I'll just say, oh God, would you please show my wife she's wrong? <laughs> Huh? 99% of the time, guess who eats crow? And God shows me that I'm not where I need to be. But, but, but the peace of, peace of God, let, let it rule uh, in your heart. Verse 16, I gotta get, I gotta get on this. Whew. Let the word of Christ dwell. Uh, underline, I can't, I, can't, I can't really talk to you all about 16, but underline, circle the word dwell. The literal tra Greek translation is this, be at home, be at home. Let the word of Christ be at home in you richly. Oh, th that's some good stuff right there. Now I, I go into some places that I don't always feel at home. Y'all ever go in somebody's house and you just don't feel at home in that house? You, you tracking with me, dude? Just please. I, I went into one uh, just down the road and, 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 and pit bulldogs everywhere. And I thought, oh my. And I walked up on the porch and, and went into the house. There were chickens running all in the house. Five gallon buckets of, of eggshells. I don't know what they were for, but they were stationed everywhere along the floor. And there were other animals running in and out of the house. Dinner was on the table. And the, and the, the, the woman of the house said, preacher, you want a pork chop? I, I didn't feel at home. I, I didn't feel at home. I, not too far this way. It, it, that one was this way. This was this way. I, I was down there and I needed to use the telephone. And, and, and I, they, sure, preacher, you can use the phone. I went over to pick up the phone and before God now, there, there must have been 150 cockroaches right there around that telephone. I, I didn't feel at home there. I went in one not long ago, got out of my car, I, um, walked across the sidewalk, the porch lights were on. I thought, wow, this is good. No dogs barking, felt really good about that. Rang the doorbell, people came to the door ushered me in. They didn't stop in the living room. They took me to the kitchen and we sat down at a kitchen and, and, and they put a hot piece of pecan pie right in front of me. On, I felt at home in that house. Huh? Here's what Paul is saying. He, he's saying, don't let your life and the habits of your life cause the word of God to say to you, 
excuse me, but I don't feel at home here. Um, all our behavior needs to be evaluated on the basis as to whatever we do that the word of God says, I feel comfortable here. I feel at home. Look at verse 17 and I'll close. Whatsoever you do, this doesn't even need a commentary. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father uh, by him. Whatever you do, wherever you go, whatever you say, do it all in the name. Some of you are going to have a, some of you are going to have a Super Bowl party tonight. You, you've got life group members coming. You, you've got unchurched people coming tonight to, to celebrate with you and eating the snacks. It, it, when you're eating, do it all in the name of Jesus. When you're watching the Super Bowl, do it all in the name of Jesus. Wh whatever, he says. Everything. We're to do it in the name of Jesus. I love that next little phrase he says in verse 17. Giving thanks to God. Second Thessalonians says, we're to give thanks for all things. When, you, when your transmission falls out of your car, thank you, Lord. When your washing machine overflows, and ruins your hardwood floors. Thank you, Lord. Hmm. Whatever. The Bible says we're to be thankful. Are you thankful? So here we are. Get rid of all of these liabilities in your life, Paul says. Get rid of that. That old nature, lay it down, lay it aside, and dress up in the things that you're going to demonstrate and display before the rest of the world that you have been transformed, that you have been saved. Let them see the obvious difference of a person that has conversion clothes on. Is that you? I wonder, are there some areas of your life maybe that the word of God has just taking his finger and he says, you need to work on this. You need to work on this one or you need to work on that one. Or maybe you've been involved in some things that maybe the word of God says, I don't really feel comfortable going where you're going. I don't feel comfortable around the people that you're around. I don't feel comfortable with the language that you're using. I don't feel comfortable with what you're putting in your body. Clothe yourself. Would you stand with me and let's pray. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fbcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.